Ladies and gentlemen, this is Tosh Berman. This is Tosh Talks. And today I want to focus on Andy Warhol. Folks in Andy Warhol is a huge subject matter alone, correct? Well, I'm just going to focus on his screen test, the Andy Warhol screen test. And the basis for my chat is actually two things. One is Andy Warhol screen test, which is a credible book. It's by uh, Callie Angel, and I, I, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, Callie Angel is a, um, uh, she was the head of the main um, focus for the Andy Warhol Museum of uh, restoring all the Warhol films. And um, this is a major job because Warhol left many, many, many films uh, after he passed away, of course. And uh, it's her responsibility at the time to uh, categorize, write down the history of each film, who was in the film, information like that, date, year, where, all that type of stuff. And besides that, then we have the DVD set called uh, 13 Most Beautiful, the Andy Warhol screen test. And this is actually the film, or some of the film, 13 films. Um, What's interesting about the screen test is that there's, at least by appearance, or at least on the surface, not interesting at all. Basically, it's this Warhol's camera, a 16 millimeter camera, filming, or photography, but filming a face, an individual of all sorts. Some of the people he uh, photographed are people who work in the factory. The factory is, was, was Warhol studio, <clears throat> and he called it a factory. I think in the nature of uh, one is a film studio, like a Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, Canal Films, you choose your film studio, he based it at sort of that. On the other hand, it's also a painting studio or an art studio. For instance, like the Renaissance artists all had a studio, of course, and they had helpers and workers to help the painter do his work. So it's a tradition of sort of like going back to the Renaissance or to church related painting where you had a whole crew of people working on something with one person sort of being the visionary. And in this case, the visionary is Andy Warhol, who had many assistants. Most famous is Gerard Malenga, who is a, a really good poet, excellent poet, who worked with uh, Warhol a lot during the 60s and helped them work on the screen test as well as Paul Morrissey. Who, was a, who became a well-known filmmaker under Warhol's um, help and production. Uh, he did uh, Warhol's Frankenstein, Warhol's Dracula, um, Flesh. Uh, a lot of people think those are Warhol-directed films. It's Paul Morrissey films, but Warhol's name is attached to the title. It's his production. So in a way, of course, Warhol is a brand name. And the name Warhol, you probably come across thinking like Warhol, like, um, you know, soup cams, the double Elvis portraits, and of course his film work. Ironically enough, though he's, Warhol is probably one of the most famous filmmakers as well as artists, probably not that many people have actually seen his films. Um, I have seen uh, only a handful of his work, um, including the 13 Most Beautiful. But I also saw um, Tarzan and Jane Regain, Sort Of, which is a film that Warhol made in uh, Los Angeles in 64, 65. The main reason why I've seen this film is because I'm in the movie. Yes. Thirteen Most Beautiful. When I was younger. No, Warhol never shot me that way, <laughs> or never been in, the, in, in his portrait. But I played Boy, the son of Tarzan. To Taylor Mead was my father, he was Tarzan. And my father, Wallace Berman, was the villain or the bad guy. And that film, partly, one day, was shot in uh, at our home, our family home in Beverly Glen, in Los Angeles area. And um, I have a clear memory of that whole day, when I because, for one, 
it was very odd for me to be confronted by a camera or being shooting a movie or any of that sort. At the same time, it was a very casual day. I pretty much could do whatever I wanted, as far as I can remember. I think I was told what to do. I have to be presumed I was told what to do by Andy Warhol. I remember Taylor Mead, who played Tarzan. I remember the woman who played Jane. Uh, I remember, of course, my father. The only person I have no memory of whatsoever is Andy Warhol himself. I know he was there. <laughs> he directed the movie. He directed me. I have no memory of him whatsoever. I've been told many years later, many decades later, that this is not unusual <laughs> to remember Warhol. But nevertheless, so I saw Tarzan and Jane regain sort of, which I recommend for anybody not only interested in Warhol, but interested in Los Angeles cultural history of the 60s, because Dennis Hopper is in it, uh, Klaus Oldenburg, a great artist, and my dad, of course. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an important film document of a time and a place. Is it a great film? You decide of that. I'm not going to make any um, critical judgments on that. What I do prefer is the film I, I saw maybe about four or five years ago at uh, MOCA, the Museum of Contemporary Art in downtown Los Angeles. I saw Empire. And Empire is an eight-hour film of just a camera focusing, not moving, just focusing on the Empire Building, Empire State Building in New York in Manhattan. Eight hours. I saw three hours. I, saw, I sat for three of those eight hours. I left because I was bored crazy, because this is so boring, doesn't make sense. Why watch a building? No, I got hungry. That's why I left. I left three hours because I had to go somewhere for an appointment or I had to eat something. But that three hours I stayed, from the beginning to the three hours in the movie, I was hypnotized by the film. It, it was, and still is, the best experience I've ever been to to see a film. I've never seen a better film than Empire. Um, why do I like Empire? Well, Warhol is sort of focused on real time. He likes the idea of real time. You know, he made a 24-hour movie called 24-Hour Movie. The uh, screen test that he took of each person lasts for four minutes. Every screen test is one roll of 16-millimeter film. I think sh shot at silent speed or 16 frames per minute. I'm not sure. But anyway, the, the, each portrait lasts for four minutes and it's projected in slow motion. And uh, Empire, the building, is shot in the same mode but lasts for eight hours and is shown in silent speed. And um, what's the beauty of the film is that um, it was made, I think, around the same time as doing the screen test, which is people, right? People have a little bit more interest. You can see their eyes and nose. But the building itself is a star. In the Empire State Building, I don't know how many of you have actually seen it in person or the photographs of it, it's a really remarkable, beautiful Art Deco structure. It's a beautiful building. And often at times, you know, sometimes you want to stand back and just look at a building or look at a person's face, but it's kind of not polite to do so. I mean, right now I'm looking, at, I'm looking at you right now for the lens. I'm looking at your face. I'm imagining what your eyes look like, your mouth, tongue, nose. But me to stand in front of you, if we're actually there just looking at you, that would be kind of rude, I think. But watching a movie is sort of like a voyeur. You're not knowing I'm watching you. So I can go into a movie theater, sit down, and watch the Empire State Building without anybody interrupting me or talking to me. I can just focus on that building, the beautiful building. Is it the most beautifully shot movie of a beautiful building? Probably not. I'm sure there's better photographs of the Empire State Building and other formats, other photographs. But the beauty of the Empire Building, the Empire State Building, is that, is, is that you're looking at it without any drama, without any, you're not you know, any baggage except what's in your head. So you yourself is bringing the drama into the theater of watching Empire. And this is what I find really interesting because I'm not being manipulated by anybody. I'm not being manipulated by a story or a narrative. There is no narrative except a story in my head. I'm looking at a window or, or the second, or hmm, how, how many stories is the Empire State Building? Let's say it's 30, you know, 40 floors. I'm just focusing on the 30th floor for some reason. I don't know why. I'm looking at the windows, can't really see it clearly. 
But then you try to imagine in my head, like, what's happening on the 30th floor right now at the time of the filming? What's, 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 you know, what's, what's happening? And I don't know, you know, but my imagination is going, you know. And then it gets darker, right? Because what comes, there's daylight, and then what comes after daylight is nighttime. So all of a sudden, the Empire movie becomes like a gothic tale because it turns dark. And you see it going slowly turning dark, and it's beautiful. Because I think most people love seeing the dawn, because the beautiful sun rising over a landscape, or the sun going down. And so you're watching the Empire State Building as the sun goes down. And I think there's some reflections. If I can, if I, you know, from my memory, I remember like a reflection of the sun. I could have, that could be totally my imagination. You know, each person could see something differently. But it was very beautiful as the Empire State Building is in front of you and it disappears. And then it becomes black. You see like lights inside the apartment, you know, inside the building, like a, like a wind for the window and stuff that eventually fades out to almost pure blackness. And then all of a sudden the building lights go on, the decorative lights. And I was in the audience of about five people. <laughs> Empire is very, probably never shown. And when it is shown in Los Angeles at MOCA, the museum, only five people show up. That's how popular Andy Warhol to this day, it, the real popularity of Andy Warhol. Probably hard, to, I couldn't find anybody to go see an eight hour movie with Empire with me. And actually it's a movie to see alone. It's not really a thing to share with somebody else. And so when the lights go on in Empire, the building lights, it's everyone, <gasps> everybody said that all five people, including me said, <gasps> and the projectionist who's in the, in the room not in the projecting booth, but he's actually projecting the film in the audience, you know, from the audience point of view, he even gasped. So six people, sorry. Five, I, I, <laughs> I paid, I presume other people paid, and the projections got him free because he's working there. But we all grasped, we went, <gasps> and I never grasped in a movie, like a horror movie, like you see somebody coming with a knife or coming out of a, you know, a window after you. But seeing Empire, that moment when the lights turn on, was almost like, not only a surprise, but it was like one of the most greatest releases I ever felt in a movie theater. And until I had to leave, because I had to leave after three hours, um, it, was, it, it is one of the best films I've ever, I have ever seen. I, it's a classic, great film. Now, back to the 13 most beautiful, or Andy Warhol screen test. What is interesting here? Um, people, people around Warhol. People around Andy Warhol or who hung out at the factory or went to the factory have something very in common. One, they're beautiful people. They're handsome. The women are incredibly gorgeous and they're interesting people. So I'm seeing portraits of really interesting people. Not one of them is boring. Not one of them is ugly. Not one of them is hideous. They're all fascinating people. And when I look at Callie Angel's, Angel's Andy Warhol screen test book, where she just totally wants well, a catalog resume of all of his, of his, of his uh, screen tests, where she had to go individually to each film, each reel, identify the person, which is sometimes really easy, like Bob Dylan, Donovan, you know, Dennis Hopper, you know, famous faces. There. Lynn were very famous, Allen Ginsberg, you know, um, John Ashbery, the great poet. You know, there's a lot of great famous personalities and great artists and poets. Salvador Dali is in it here too. But there's all unknown people that have a name like Bill or Joey or something. Who knows who these people are? They may be like street hustlers. They may be delivery boy. You know, maybe delivering a pizza and Warhol saw his face or Paul Morris saw his face. Hey, you know, you, you have an extra 10 minutes. Can you sit, sit for us and we'll, we'll photograph you? So there's an aesthetic choice here. You know, Warhol chose, or Morrissey or Malenga, but I presume, let's say it was Warhol. Warhol chose the faces to be in front of that camera, that, to, to do the portrait. You know, later in life, Warhol has done painted portraits of people, you know, like Marilyn Monroe, of course, Elvis Presley. But, in the, you know, in the 80s, before he passed away, he was doing portraits of people, and he's being paid for that by, by the sitter. You know, if I, want a port if I want Warhol to paint me or do a screen Thing of, or not screen, but like a still screen portrait of me, I would more likely have to pay him to, for that services. And then I guess I'll buy the painting as well. 
that's what Warhol was doing, you know, towards the 80s, besides doing his own individual art. He became a commercial artist in a sense. But at this time, Warhol was just doing stuff that he was interested in. So we're talking about like right from like 64 to 66. This is like two years, the screen test. And um, what's fascinating to watch this thing, okay, if you get this, you do get music. You do get a soundtrack. I recommend not listening to the music. The music is really good. It's by the guy, um, the Dean, um, what's his name? Dean, uh, give me one second. I should know these things by heart, but I'm so, I find that so boring. Dean uh, Wareham, well-known uh, singer-songwriter, and, he did, and the music is great. But I prefer no music and just watch just the portraits with no sound. And originally, that's how it was screened, with no sound. For the DVD, they added music, or maybe for future showings, they added music. Because people need to hear stuff to see stuff, which I am totally against. Empire, for eight hours, is totally silent. I mean, you know, I don't need, I don't need music. I got music in my head to listen to, you know, like when I'm watching Empire. So the same thing with the portraits. So without the music, it's just you and the face. And you can look at this book, you know, and find out who's who, who you're looking at. But it's kind of actually more interesting if you just sort of forget about that and just sort of focus on the face. And you're going to recognize people in this DVD set, this film, of like Lou Reed of Velvet Underground. And... It's, you know, it's Lou Reed. Lou Reed in dark sunglasses drinking a Coca-Cola. Sounds fascinating, right? It is. It's, it's as good as, I wish it lasted as long as Empire. I wish it was like eight hours long instead of four minutes. But you have like Mary Wernoff here. You know, you have, um, who else do you have? You have uh, Edie Sedrick, the iconic Edie. And um, each portrait Interesting enough, is not, of course, it's not the same because people are different. And Warhol captures the difference of these people. They're all, what they have in common, again, that they're beautiful, they're sexy, they're attractive, are really interesting. So you're looking at these really great looking faces, in my opinion. This is totally a subjective. You know, it's, but Warhol, in a way, in appear, by appearance and aesthetic, seems to be objective, and that's argumentative. I suspect he's subjective, but I'm definitely watching these movies at a very subjective point of view. You know, I'm looking, I recognize this person, and they go, oh, that's Edie, she's interesting, you know, she's beautiful. And I have to say, in this film that's here, she is exquisitely beautiful, very vulnerable. You know, you start looking at her lips and her eyes, it's amazing, it's fantastic looking. And it's, it's so you're getting their character, you know, and it's, it's really interesting. Some of this, a lot of the faces are just looking at the camera straight ahead. And there's one woman, her name is uh, Anne. Her name is um, Anne Buchanan, who apparently was hung out with the Beats. And she's fascinating because she's the first film here. And she's beautiful, of course, and she's looking directly at the camera. She's not moving. Camera stays still. Camera's always in one place, one position, stays there. And she's looking at the camera head on, and she looks like she's kind of smiling, but, she, but you see tears slowly going down her cheek. And it goes down, down, and it, and it becomes like a drop here. And then you see it, you know, like drop. And then her other tear, the other eye starts tearing up. And then, you know, and it drops. And that is sort of like a narrative on what, you know, there's a story there. Why she's crying, I don't know. Is she crying out of happiness, out of sadness? Is she an actress who can just, you know, just do the tear thing? I have the Fox ideal, and Warhol himself did not know. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't instruct her to cry. She just cried. So that that was kind of a, you know that's kind of a dramatic thing. Um, the other one is as one of the uh, women brushing her teeth, and she's brushing her teeth in a very energetic way of brushing one's teeth, and it has a very sexual connotation with that toothbrush in her mouth. Saw all this foam coming out of the, of the, of the toothpaste. And so, so, so there's a little bit of pornography here, sort of, perhaps. Uh, but each portrait is interesting because sometimes some of the sitters can't sit still. The camera is still. The camera doesn't move. That's a rule. But the sitter moves around. Something they go off camera. They move out here. The camera stays here, and then suddenly you just see the wall, and you just see like a, the guy's ear or the girl's ear. 
and then they come back sort of, and then they, they look at the camera, and then they're like lost in thought, they're thinking about something, they're looking at something. And then they sort of remember that in front of a camera, and they go, go back to the camera again. So, you know, there are, you know, one guy's chewing gum, you know, uh, you know and then he sort, of, he sort of forgets himself, and, and he's not like, you know, he's like posing in front of a camera. But then he sort of forget, forgets he's posing, and then he just sort of off, you know, he's off something else. Or somebody's talking to him, you know, off camera, and he's responding sometimes. Usually they're not talking. They look like they're just trying to focus to be on the camera, being a, being a sitter. Yet they get kind of nervous. They get kind of ner- you know, they get, they're not really comfortable, but they, you know, they move around. Some are very straight ahead. The one poser who I did not like, poser, that's a good term, uh, sitter, sorry, is uh, Dennis Hopper. And the reason why I don't like Dennis Hopper in this Warhol film is because he's an actor. He's acting. You see him like sitting there like trying to look emotional. Yes, and he's going for the James Dean moment. And that's perfectly fine. He, Dennis Hopper is a great actor. But I kind of wish that he wasn't acting. I just wish he was just sitting there doing nothing. But he was acting. He's conveying emotion. He's, he's, you know, he has facial expression. You know, he's, he knows how to use himself in the camera. So he, he's definitely doing that. And it's very interesting. Of the 13, um, some are like Warhol assistants. Some are like anonymous people. One is Billy Nain. Great photographer, but also one of the key Warhol associates of those years. But some of them are models. So like Nico, who's in here, you know, um, Edie Sedwick. These are people who are, who are used to be in front of a camera. So it's interesting to see Nico as a model, who at that time, even like from the early 60s, you know, she, she was a model in Europe, in Germany and elsewhere. So it's interesting how she conveys to the camera compared to, say, like Billy Name or even Lou Reed. Um, um, so actually, so there's a lot of variety and a lot of things to think about. So the 13 most beautiful, it is a great DVD collection. It's put out by a uh, flexi film. You get a little book, gives you an introduction to everybody, what happens to them. It's, it's fascinating. And, and the film is great. The film is great. And again, I recommend listening to it silent. Do listen to it for the music, but don't, you know, don't, don't. Just listen with the movie, with the music. Make sure you watch the film without any sound at all. And this book, Andy Warhol Screen Test, which has been out for a while, maybe out of print now. I'm always showing you stuff that's out of print. I don't know why. It's a weird show that way. But this is an exquisite book. If anybody's interested in Warhol, anything, you'd be interested in this book. If you're interested in cinema, you must have this book. If you're interested in Warhol cinema, a must, of course. And in this book, um, Angel lists all the films, all the self-portraits, who they are, and she gives a little history of what happens to them after, you know, in life. So it's a really fascinating read and how she documents uh, everything to like a, like a science. And Warhol is a science. You know, Warhol is a collector. Warhol is a famous collector. And I think his, a lot of his artwork instead of deals with collecting. So when Warhol makes his portraits, the screen tests, and screen tests, you know, are usually to try out see if an actor or actor looks good in, in front of a you know, camera and they photograph well and they can act or say a line, and then they get the job, hopefully, for that role they're going after. But screen test is not for any movie or for a future Warhol project. Screen test is the end result. So Warhol, in a sense, is collecting his people around him, documenting things. So... If nothing, at the very least, you are, if you're going to get hung up as this art or not art, then you could think about that. But at the very least, he's documenting his world as much as he can, you know? Like, I know you guys see my, you know, once in a while you see my books in the bookshelves, and I get, like, responses or questions like, oh, can't you photograph your books more or show the books? And I could. I could, like, photograph each book cover and make that into a book, and that would be a really interesting book, right? That would be fascinating. It would be a portrait of who I am, but but also my taste, and you will reflect on that taste. Warhol photographed faces that you reflect on, that he reflected on. Either he had the sexually feelings for that person, or he thought they were beautiful, or something interesting about them. You know, we don't know. But you yourself as a viewer look at this, and you make a decision. You can, make, you can decide if this person is interesting or not interesting. I find them very interesting. And as you look at my face, which of course you find interesting, 
I am Tosh Berman. This is Tosh Talks. Goodbye.